Okay, for chapter 16, we have a couple of new philosophies that we want to address, although uh, for practical purposes I don't really treat these as two separate philosophies. In my mind they're very much the similar uh, kinds of philosophies and um, we're going to just cover them in, in a general way because what we want to do is we want to take a couple of things from them. Uh, the, for the most immediate purposes, um, some of this stuff is going to set us up to talk about Freud in chapter 17, and then it's also going to set us up to talk about the uh, humanistic or existential psychology movement in chapter 18. Okay, the first of these two philosophies is called Romanticism, and to get an idea of what this is about, we might want to take a look at, at um, what philosophy was all about uh, around this time frame. And in this time frame we're talking about the uh, late 18th, early 19th century. And there were two dominant theories about the human mind. There was the old rationalist philosophies that dated back to the Greeks, in particular the Greeks like Plato and Pythagoras and so forth. And that philosophy, if you recall, treated the ultimate aspect of the human mind as being our rational ability. What they did is they, they um, suggested that you could not trust your senses, that there was no real point in trying to obtain any wisdom with, through the senses, and that they completely disregarded the senses, really, and placed all of the emphasis on the human uh, mind and, and human reason. So uh, from that perspective, the ultimate way to achieve happiness is to ignore the passions, to ignore the senses, and to focus purely on reason and logic and higher thought, mathematics and philosophy and so forth. And of course that kind of philosophy and that kind of lifestyle only appeals to a very small number of people. So there is a great uh, deal that, that would feel alienated on, from that kind of philosophy. The main reaction philosophically to that though was the British empiricist movement and that was epitomized first by John Locke who argued that we're a blank slate so uh, th therefore he's getting rid of innate knowledge and getting rid of all of the innate rational mind stuff and culminating in David Hume who was as you recall a skeptic arguing that all that we really know is the output of our own senses and therefore we don't really know much of what's going on in the world and we just passively receive sensations and the laws of association go to work to create all of the knowledge that we have as Locke had described it as as being built up from simple ideas to complex ideas and so from that perspective we don't even get to use our rational mind we are simply just passive perceivers, passive recipients of sensory information. What both of these philosophies lack is a philosophy about the passions, the emotion, and the intuitive side of the human being, and also because the empiricist uh, f version of, of the philosophy was deterministic and did not accept free will, it uh, didn't include that as well. So what the Romantic movement was all about was about emphasizing what it really means to be a human being. And from their perspective, any complete philosophy uh, needed to include not just our, our sensory uh, capacities and our logical capacities, but also the emotional and the intuitive side, the irrational side of, of the mind. And so that was the only way to have a really whole or complete philosophy. Uh, is to include all of that stuff and to even celebrate those aspects of humanity and that's why this is really considered less of a philosophical movement and perhaps more of an artistic movement because what we see is that romantic themes are characterized in in paintings and sculptures and, and operas and, and symphonies like Beethoven and Wagner and that th the, the character of those pieces is often typically very dramatic and emotional uh, to characterize the sort of storm and stress that uh, is typical of, of a human life. One key point 
of the Romantic movement, but it's also something that's, that's uh, critical to the existentialist movement, is the role of instinct. The idea here is that all people have instinctual needs and instinctual desires that they need to satisfy. And this is the part that we're going to use to help us set us up to think about Freud because of his uh, starting point that we are born with that layer of the personality called the it, which is the reservoir that contains all of our unconscious instinctual drives. And so there are two figures here, Schopenhauer, who was generally considered part of the Romantic movement, and then Friedrich Nietzsche, who is part of the existentialist movement. But they both had a lot to say about the role of instinct and how we should, be, be, should, we, how we should deal with our instinctual needs. So first let's talk about Arthur Schopenhauer. He suggested that the primary instinct that every person had, he labeled it the will to survive, but another way of describing it is just simply calling it fear of death. That that is what drives uh, and motivates everyone, that everything that we do is driven by this fear of, of dying. Every, every behavior, every action that we engage in is something that is ultimately traced to um, this motivation to stay alive. So uh, according to Schopenhauer then, this fear causes us to engage in a lot of what he called need-based behaviors because we have this need to do things that keep us alive and, and keep death at arm's length. So obviously basic things like eating and drinking are part of these need-based behaviors, but the problem with them is that even though we have a need to satisfy these things, Engaging in the activities that satisfy them, such as such as eating a nice big heavy meal, um, doesn't actually make the fear go away. It doesn't make death go away permanently. It is only a temporary satisfaction. And as Schopenhauer argued, the more you give in to these needs, and the more you try and satisfy these needs, you will only just make them stronger because they still keep coming back again and again and again. And so the person who engages in these need-based behaviors, whether it is eating or drinking or even Schopenhauer considered sex to be part of that because again sexual procreation is a, another way of keeping yourself alive figuratively speaking. So all of these things uh, can, if we give in to them too much, can take over our lives and govern, uh, our, govern us and, and take away from achieving true happiness in life. Schopenhauer considered these these instinctual needs to be somewhat primitive. He argued that this kind of instinctual need to stay alive is something that we share with animals. Uh, this you know instinctual need to to not die. Schopenhauer also argued though that there is something unique about humans. What separates us from animals is that we have the ability to transcend. We have the ability to rise above these needs. We have the ability to push them aside. Obviously, we can't just decide to stop eating and drinking, but we can control that need. We can, we can moderate it and engage in everything in moderation. And the idea here is that we should be channeling those energies, those instinctual energies or needs, not into those need-based behaviors, but into other kinds of things that he labeled non-need-based behaviors. This process is called sublimation, to take those energies and to channel them into those other, other activities so he suggested, for example, this is the source of all creativity. So in creating art, whether it's music or paintings or, uh, or drama or writing or even scholarly endeavors, all of these things are, are not related to the will to survive. These are ways of channeling that energy into a different outlet. And so again, just like transcendence is something unique to humanity, so is creativity and art, something that is unique to, to human beings as well. And it's all ultimately, of course, driven by the instinctual energies associated with the, with the will to survive. So in a nutshell, what we see with Schopenhauer is that everyone has this particular instinct. And the way we should be dealing with this instinct is not to give into it, but rather to sublimate that energy into different outlets. Friedrich Nietzsche, on the other hand, has a very different perspective. His view on instinct is not that we are driven by fear, fear of death, but rather he called his instinct will to power. And the will to power 
is an instinctual need that we all have to achieve our full potential. In the 20th century, when we get to the humanistic psychology movement, we're going to call this something else. We're going to call it self-actualization. But the idea is that everyone has an instinctual need to achieve whatever full potential that they have in their particular life. And of course, this is going to be unique for every individual person based on our own personalities and our own needs. Uh, that's going to shape uh, how we should be living our own life. And so for Nietzsche, transcending or rising above this des uh, need is actually not desirable because that means putting aside your own needs uh, to engage in other behaviors. But rather, for Nietzsche, the ultimate goal of life is to figure out what your own needs actually are and to make decisions to take control over your life to do those things that uh, will allow you to express your potential and to actually achieve uh, happiness in life. So he argued then that you should not be um, paying attention to how other people live their lives and letting other people tell you how to live your life because that is their life and not yours, that you should be more in touch with your own instinctual needs and desires and fully express those to reach your full potential or what he called the Superman, which really just means the ultimately evolved human being, someone who has achieved uh, that their full humanity. One last point about the existentialist movement that is relevant to what Nietzsche is saying is something that is also echoed by philosophers such as Rousseau and Goethe. And for them, one of the key points and one of the most important points is free will. They argued that we do possess free will and as Nietzsche would be arguing the only way that we could really achieve this full potential is to be free. We need to be able to exist in a situation where we are free to make decisions over our own lives so that we can actually achieve that potential to achieve whatever it is that we need out of this life. And I'm mentioning it on the slide here, Anne Rand, because if you think back to our discussion of behaviorism and, and B.F. Skinner, and he made his argument that uh, freedom and liberty were actually illusory concepts because he was a determinist. And Rand was making an argument that basically just the opposite, that the only way to be happy is to be free. And what she's saying is echoing this kind of existentialist movement from guys like Rousseau and Nietzsche. So what Rousseau had argued is that if you had a person who lived in a situation where they were maybe living off in the wilderness, untouched by society, because for, it is society really that places these restrictions on our free will, a person living off on their own in the wilderness would be able to maximize their free will and their freedom of expression. And Rousseau said that such a person is in, would be inherently good and also living in, in uh, perfect harmony with his or her surroundings and would be happy and contented and it would be what he labeled a noble savage. And it's equivalent to Nietzsche's concept of the Superman. It would be someone who, uh, because they have maximum freedom, is expressing their own personal needs and living up to their own, to their own uh, version of humanity. And that's the ultimate uh, perspective from this uh, philosophy, is that we need to exercise our free will to be in control of our own life, to be in touch with our own instinctual needs, and achieve that full potential.